Well, how was your time? You spent three and a half months at Rigers. How was that? How was your experience in prison? How's the food from a chef perspective? Not good, but Rikers was, um, when I got to Rikers, because I, so I was arrested. I spent, I think, about 10 days in a Tennessee, small town Tennessee jail. Um, oh, Pigeon Forge is also the weirdest place is on it, earth. Is that a town? Yes, that's the town Forge? where I was arrested. It's, why, why is it so weird? Um, in the film, they I told them, I told them, you have to go to Pigeon Forge. You have to go there. You have to go there. And I, I would think I was pushing them because it was going to potentially be the end of the season. It's like a, a summertime or it's a tourist destination. And it's so bizarre and weird and trippy that um, it doesn't even seem real. It seems like a carnival is happening there nonstop. Exactly. It's it's. Car I think I say that in my intro that it's carnivalesque and trippy and weird. Is there um, a lot of clowns walking around or not necessarily clowns, but there is a video on YouTube that I because I got to the chapter where we arrive in Pigeon Forge and I'll never forget, although I have forgotten, but I remember being like weirdly like felt like we were had entered a different universe driving down this strip and just looking at everything on either side and I'm wishing that I could remember in more detail like the names of the places or what was there because I wanted to describe it um in this chapter and I was like oh, I wish somebody I wish there was like a video of somebody going down the street kind of showing what's on one side and then the other side and I was like there probably is and there is on there YouTube is. like I found it and I watched the whole thing how does this come up from prison exactly um, Pigeon. <laughs> oh, okay. Why did that spark So it? that's the town that I went to jail in. Oh, right. At first. In Tennessee. All right. So what was that like? The food there and some of the conditions. The food made... When I got to... Um, then I was extradited and transferred to Rikers. And when I got to Rikers, I felt like it was like the four seasons in comparison. Wow. So, um, and I, I really kind of appreciated a lot of things about about New York when I got when I got to Rikers, even though there are a lot of things that are very scary about it. Where's uh, Rikers located? Is it close to New York City? Yes, and in a very kind of almost poetically interesting way, the the dorm room where I was when I was there for the three and a half months was one of the ones that faced Manhattan. So I could go across the room and look out the window and see the whole Manhattan skyline. To the view. Which was I remember being shocked by the cost per prisoner per year. Yes, that uh, New York pays is like four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars something. It's I didn't think it was that much. I thought I wrote it down, but either way, it is. No, I mean it. It, it elevated uh, during COVID, which is fascinating. To that, the number I just said. Yeah. During COVID, I felt sick to my stomach thinking about people stuck there. And again, so Rikers isn't like a long-term prison. It's most of the people at Rikers are awaiting trial. And they, they've been arrested but not convicted. And then if you're convicted and you're sentenced to less than a year, then you put on a different color uniform and you go upstairs to different dorms. Um, if you're convicted and sentenced to more than a year, you're sent to one of the upstate prisons. Um, so most of the people at Rikers are there in transition. They've been arrested, but not, um, they've been arrested, but not convicted or awaiting trial. So you could be perfectly innocent and you're stuck there. And that happens to a lot of people. Or you could be arrested over some kind of comparatively petty thing or nonviolent thing and, and stuck there because you don't have as little as $500 to pay bail, which is completely messed up and unjust. And I think most people, most reasonable people agree that it's unjust. But it's different when you're there and you see those people and you see um, kind of the anguish. And whether, I mean, I have no idea if they're guilty of what, I mean, I, I'm, I usually don't know what people are there for, or what the situation is, but you watch the sort of help helplessness set in um 
because you're kind of powerless there. You have very little contact with the outside world. You have these limited phone calls. And so for people who had kids and a job and an apartment, it's like one by one, those things are lost or their kids are now being looked after by their abusive ex-husband or something like that. And so watching that is just gut-wrenching. And then also knowing that the only reason they're unable to get out is because of you know, $1,000, $2,000, in some cases, $500. There were people, um, so there's all of these tragic cases, but then there was also, while I was there, I mean, if I'd had any money, I would have been wanting to bail people out left and right. And then in some cases, I think there was a woman there who snored really loud and her bail was $500. And I was like, <laughs> I, I wish I had them. I want to bail her. She just wanted to bail her out, so... Um, because I'm pretty sensitive to sounds and being in a room with 50 people, inevitably. So you're in in a, in a room with, with a large number of people. Yeah, there are um, uh, there are areas there with cells, but a lot of the areas there are um, rooms with 50 beds. So and they're about three feet apart from each other. So during COVID, there was certainly no social distancing. Yeah. Um, and that just felt kind of sickening, especially because. So many of the people are there for nonviolent things or drug addiction related or mental health issues. Um, so how did that, you personally, just having spent that time there for three and a half months, how did that change you? Like, what did that have an effect on your mind? On my mind, personally, I think I was. I was surprised at how well I adapted and then how I was able to, um, and then I think I sort of took it a next level when one of the books somebody sent me was um, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Mm -hmm. And it's very much about like observing your mind and um, that kind of helped take it a next level. So Was this like a meditation retreat for you? <laughs> it, well, it's like, It'd be like trying to meditate in the middle of a circus or yeah. in crazy circumstances because you're never alone. There's nowhere to be alone. And there's People always are talking, there's noises, there's fighting, noises, chaos. Um, Did you feel in danger? Yes, but um, I, I never I never felt terrified there. Um you know, one of my friends, the bathroom is the scary place because they don't have cameras in the um, in yeah. the bathroom. So that's sort of a, one has to watch out there. And I did, one of my friends who I, one of the people I was friends with there, she did get um, beat up a bit in the bathroom one day. A lot of weird shit happened in the bathroom. <laughs> um, but it was... From a, if you're interested in human behavior and psychology, and it's it can be fascinating to kind of so sit were, there and watch. Things. You were saying like you might enjoy prison for that perspective, like just you get to watch human nature. And it's um, like at the, the I don't want to say that it's worse, but like the full variety that it can uh, take. Right, and there was a lot of beauty there as well. I mean, was there love? People being. Um, well, again, depends on the definition of love, but people being, you know, incredibly generous and kind to each other. Um, um, sometimes people singing at night. Um, <laughs> there was just a lot of, and then there was a lot of, you know, hilarious stuff. It's just, it's all there. There's like, there's tragic things, um, you know, interesting things. A lot of people with mental health issues, which is um, can be difficult to witness, 